you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show dot com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. For Fourteen years I had to sing that line, and now the Iron Lady does it, and I can never so happy every time she does it. She does it so much better than I do. Welcome to the Big Show, my family and friends. As always, we bring you two to three great shows a day, weekday, I should say. I'm not working on weekends for you people. Give me a break. So check out the five to ten, fifteen podcasts we're putting out every week. We call ourselves the Netflix of podcasting because you can binge watch anything. If you want to binge watch political authors, you can do that. If you want to binge watch romance novels, you can do that. Everything is on the Chris Voss show, almost everything. I think the OnlyFans content isn't on here yet, but there's still time. If we get bored, we'll see what happens. But there's a site for that, so we're not going to bother with it. Anyway, guys, we have some amazing authors, minds thought leaders, CEOs, entrepreneurs on the show, sharing with you all their greatest insights, their stories, and everything else to make you smarter. And today we'll be talking to an amazing attorney for his newest and latest book called Fired, Afraid You Might Be. Use legal leverage to fight back against your employer and win on your terms. This is book two of two of his Fired book series. March 27th, 2020. Four came out, and we have Jay Thomas Spiegel on the show with us today, attorney, we should also mention, and he's going to be talking to us about his book. So if you've ever been fired, damn it, this show's for you, eh? <laughs> I think we all, has everybody been fired? Is there anybody who's not been fired? I've been fired by the Chris Voss show about 15 times, but I just keep myself <laughs> locked inside this room and barricade myself, and uh, they haven't cut off my power yet, so evidently it's great, worth Great pro tip. There you go. Pro tip. Tom Spiegel is a former federal prosecutor. He's a highly accomplished attorney who's dedicated his career to protecting your rights. He worked in as assistant United States attorney in Washington, D.C., prosecuting serious criminal cases. In 2009, he founded the Spiegel Law Firm. The firm's core mission is to help people navigate through difficult employment circumstances towards a Phoenix moment. He is a highly regarded expert and advocate in the field of employment law, known for his extensive work in combating workplace discrimination. He's a senior contributor for Forbes and the author of the, for, of the groundbreaking book, You're Pregnant. You're fired. That's the one I'm reading now, just in case. Right. Welcome to the show, Tom. How are you? Thanks, Chris. Thrilled to be here. Thrilled to have you as well. Give us your dot coms, wherever you want people to follow you on the interwebs. Yeah, our website is spigglelaw.com. Mm -hmm. And our on on X, it's just T Spiggle is where you can find me. And you can also find me at LinkedIn, the same name. There you go. Give us a thirty thousand overview. What's inside your new book? Yeah, so this book is to give people a realistic view of what an employment lawsuit might look like or taking action against your employer might look like to give them kind of the, the real nuts and bolts of how an attorney would look at your case uh -huh. so that you can begin to understand, you know, what do I have here? How far do I need to push? How do I realize, you know, my objectives? Hmm. And so it is, is a lot of, what's the right word? Undue firing? Un wrongful termination. Wrongful yeah. termination going on these days? Yes, yeah, there's a lot of wrongful termination. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, one of the reasons I put, you know, afraid you might be in the title is because we also represent people who are still at work and having problems, right? They need yeah. an accommodation, they're being harassed. Being fired is certainly a good tripwire for calling a lawyer, but you can also use one if you're still at work and uh, experiencing some problems. Mm -hmm. Do you talk about like sexual harassment in the book or other sort yes. of bullying? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So we talk about sexual harassment. We have a whole chapter on. How to tell whether or not the law has been violated and what might be, what, you know, what, how you might be covered. So, yeah, we do talk about that in the book. There you go. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in offices. And I remember when I was younger and worked for other people, sometimes you just come across people, they just don't like you and they just have it out for you. And there's sometimes doesn't seem to be a reason for it. 
other than they just, I don't know, bullying or whatever. They just don't like you. That's why I started my own company, so I could do my own bullying. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's, 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 that's all about. And uh, throw people out the second story window is the yeah. call joke on the show. But then they're going to call you. The, it's a guy to help people go into there. And then, as we mentioned, you have the other book, You're Pregnant, You're Fire. And I guess that's happening a lot, too, huh? Yeah, you'd be surprised, you know, that uh, you know, really does sometimes seems like we're still in the 1950s where, you, and you'd be surprised what some employers will put in writing about why they're letting letting a woman go. So it does happen. Wow. wow. And I think, don't, the, don't some employers ask if they can catch on or they'll, they'll they, are they allowed to ask? Is it legal to ask if, oh, if you're if, pregnant? If you're pregnant? No, not in, yeah. not in the interview process. Okay. It's not necessarily illegal to ask somebody, you know, in the workplace uh, for obvious reasons. I suggest you not do that because you could be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> right? and then that's yeah. embarrassing. Yeah. People <laughs> but, ask me if I'm pregnant all the time. Right. I'm, like, I, I'm not that fat. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, about nine months, <laughs> 10 months. Could be any day now. Any day now that's coming right. out. We, we just thought you were one of them. So whatever that means. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we we do see that quite a bit. And, that, and one of the reasons I wrote that book is because the law is regulating, you know, kind of pregnancy in the workplace and just caregiver issues generally. If you've got young kids, whether you're a male or a female, it's very complicated. And I wanted folks to be able to, you know, kind of get a sense of what's legal and what's not, because uh, it's a lot. To, it's a lot to unpack. It's a lot to follow. It used to be in the old days, you just figured, oh, if you get fired, you, you're fired, and you just got to deal with it and go get a new job. And so it sounds like you, if you can get early on, you know, I, there's these there's these guys on TikTok that talk about how once AR starts putting you in different, I guess they have like programs or something mm -hmm. where they review you every week. Yeah. There's like a, and it, it's basically as soon as you get notified of it, you know that they have you on some sort of fast track to get you pushed out. Once you're on that roller coaster ride, they're going to get you out. And I guess reading your book and some of the advice that you give to clients, they can maybe jackknife that sort of thing or, or fight. Yeah, story. yeah, they could or just know that it's coming, right? I think yeah. you're exactly right. Most organizations call it a performance improvement plan. And once you're on one of those, and nine times out of 10 in the private sector, government is a little different, but the private mm -hmm. sector, you're, you're done. And so in the book, I talk about ways you might negotiate a severance, you know, you might negotiate oh. a more favorable exit. You can't necessarily stop the, stop the firing, but you can put yourself in a better place going forward. And, you know, one of the points oh. I want to make to folks in the book is to get a realistic understanding of where you are and what your, what your possibilities are for you know, for getting, uh, let's forget justice, like some extra monies, waive a non-compete, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, but when to know if you don't have much of a case and if what you should do is try to negotiate a slightly better severance and then take the money that you have. And, you know, I have a, I list a number of other career professionals in the book, you know, maybe what you need is just a smoking resume and some more contacts and going to get a better job rather mm -hmm. than, you know, rather than saddling up and running off to federal court and spending tens of thousands of dollars and a, a bunch of time, which can be, you know, sometimes that's called for, but you need to give that some real thought because it's, you know, as you know, it can be, it can be yeah. draining in many ways. Yeah. I was fired. It's in my book, Beacons of Leadership plug. I was fired when I was 18 for long hair. And where it was just basically for long hair. And I was putting my hair in a bun, just like the other women would do. But I had a religious guy who just had it out for me in my, my satanic Van Halen concert t shirts <laughs> from the 80s. Um, that's right. We all know Van Halen worships the Satan. And yeah, and Diver that, Down. It's, that's a legion like, right that's to hell. clearly a pentagram yeah. on that cover if you, if you, blow, if you pull out. But but the benefit was I went and started my first company, and uh, three months later I came back and shook his hand, <laughs> and thanked him, and uh, said I'd make now probably three to four times more than you and have a life. Um, yeah, so that was that was the benefit of that. But I, that's an interesting idea concept. Ask, asking for asking for you know hey if you're gonna flush me out let's uh, let's just work on something now and buy me out pay me off. And a lot of people it seems are willing to do that these days I guess. Yeah, look, the employer, I mean, certainly if there's been a legal activity, then you can negotiate a pretty decent severance. Uh -huh. But but even if there hasn't been or if it's, you know, kind of borderline, like you mentioned before, you know, just having a boss that's an asshole is not it's not something you can sue for, unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd yeah. be a lot busier. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't be out of it. I would, you'd be, I would right? be sued uh, endlessly. <laughs> you'd be done for. My, my companies. But nevertheless, like even if you have a situation where you don't have a slam dunk, something illegal happen in the workplace, you know the employer still wants that severance agreement because they want the the release. They want the waiver of any because they don't have to worry about getting sued. 
uh, they, that's their opportunity to control what you're going to say about them. Because if mm-hmm. you just get fired without the severance, you within reason can say whatever you want about the company as long as yeah. it's true or you believe it to be true. But in a severance agreement, then they can lock you down with a non-disparagement agreement. They may be able to get a non-compete. So even if you don't have like a smoking gun, you're not without leverage, which is kind of the point in the book is what is what is your leverage? Is it, you know, is it just that they want your signature and want you out the door, which is some leverage? It's not going to, you know, win you lottery kind of money, but it's, it's some leverage for you to ask for some things. You know, whereas if, you know, if you've got email from the company boss, you know, demonstrating that he's a, a harasser and you got it in black and white, then you've got a bigger bargaining chip. It just, it's knowing where you, where you are on that spectrum. Yeah. I've got the boss's dick pics, but they're in color, not black and white. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so, yeah call, call me later, Chris. We'll, we'll talk. I will. I'll call you. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking for that severance. The uh, So it, there's a lot that goes on in workplaces. One of the things that I remember we were negotiating for a health insurance policy for a company, and we were going to do the thing where we paid half and they pay and the employee paid half and all that stuff. And the insurance company came in and they were, they had to look at everybody's medical records or whatever. And so they were bidding on the, on the thing and they came to me privately and they said, Hey, look, you have two employees that they, they are pretty broken and messed up and they, they, they are going to raise everyone's prices by probably 10, 15, 20 bucks on average across, you know, hundreds of employees. And if you got rid of these two people, you could really save yourself and a lot of, a lot of people money. And I sat there just going, are we really have this fucking conversation? <laughs> and two of those employees were some of my best employees. Were my best employees. The one, yeah. she was great. She had some health issues, but she was the one who was there at an hour before work and two hours after. Sure. Sometimes I'd be like, you know, you really should go home. I think we'll be, I think we'll be okay. <laughs> but you know, her son had a lot of problems with, the, he had, she had shingles and then he Ish. had schizophrenia. So there's a lot of problems there, but she was my best employee. And to me, just unethically, it was like creep show. Yeah. And they really leaned on me hard. And I said, F you just write the policy. I'm not, I'm not going to lay off anybody, but it it made me just wonder because they were so open about doing it with me, how many other people they were doing it to. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure a ton. I'm sure that happens. I'm sure that happens all the time. Yeah. And I was just like, you're so cavalier about this. Is this a, this a standard operating procedure? Fire people, and then you know, I mean, I, I, how you would fire them? So I think, I guess, what, how do people know when there's a tip off to either, you know, someone's kind of in the wrong? I mean, how do they, how do I know when to call an attorney? You know, clearly buy your book and read your book, but how do I know when to maybe it's time to consult with an attorney? Are there are there any signs or tip offs or or tips? Yeah, I mean, I think you really you go with your gut, right? If something yeah. has happened to you like that, like you had just talked about, and you're like, you know what? Like, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I haven't gone to law school, but this doesn't sound like it's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I may, you, certainly you can do your own research, right? Like you can, you know, got to be a little careful, but you can go to chat GPT, you'll go to a search engine and say, kind of type in what happened to you and say, is this illegal? And, you know, I, I wouldn't take it to the bank what you get back, but it's going to give you some kind of feedback to go from there. And then I'm a big fan of look, just call a lawyer. You don't have to hire him or her, you know, for full tilt litigation. Some people, most won't, but some people do a free consultation. But even if you have to pay, you know, 500 bucks, you know, or whatever, could be less for an, for an hour to talk to a knowledgeable attorney, you know, they can get to the bottom of it pretty quickly. If you came to me with pretty much any scenario within probably 15 minutes, I can say, you know, kind of here's where you are, you know, in terms of the legal landscape. And then there are other, there's a, there's a great site called avvo, A-V-V-O dot com, where you can go and you can post, you can post legal questions, I believe for free, and you'll get responses back from attorneys. Now, you, you know, little buyers beware. Sometimes you get what you pay for, but it's a good place to start. There you go. I like, I like you know, the subtitle of the book, Use Legal Leverage to fight back against your employer and win on your terms. And so your terms may not be always keeping that job because who wants to work there if they're paying in the ass or the hate. Right. But, you know, like you said, severance pay, working, negotiating uh, some sort of settlement. If there's been some illegal stuff that's gone on, you know, there's there's all sorts of crap that goes on now, and especially these big corporations. Sure. You know, and so there's always, there's always something. It's been interesting how 
What, what do you think about, yeah, I know Amazon, or no, was, I don't think it was Amazon, I think Google did a thing where they were trying to neuter sexual harassment lawsuits in a way that would force them to go through, I think, mediation first. Yeah, arbitration. Yeah. Arbitration, that's mm -hmm. it. And then there was a big uprising strike. People are poured out into the street and, and threw a fit, I think, over it. And so they, they were like, oh, okay, we'll just have to sneak that in on you later. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they all do. What, what are your thoughts on stuff like that? Yeah, arbitration is a big issue. It's actually, at least for sexual harassment claims now, illegal to force people into arbitration. Everybody else, sure. you guys can go to arbitration. You guys can yeah. enforce an arbitration. And it's it's a boon for the companies because it's not public, right? If you're in arbitration, like if I file a lawsuit in, in any court, it's public record. Anybody can see it. The press can see it. Yeah. Uh, if I go to arbitration, then those are it's like kind of like a secret tribunal. That doesn't mean you can't win. Mm -hmm. You can, but it's not as merely speaking of leverage. You, you lose that kind of public embarrassment leverage that you would have against a company in a regular lawsuit. So it is a it is a it's a big deal. And that's one of the threshold issues that we look at is do you have an arbitration clause? Because except for sexual harassment, the courts usually are going to uphold them. Again, it doesn't mean you don't have any leverage, you don't have rights, but it, it does tend to be better for the companies, which is why they do it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. I was kind of, I think that was the Biden law that Biden put in where, yeah, yeah I was, I, I, I like Biden, but I was pretty upset about that because I'm like, how come sexual harassment gets its own lane? It should be for everything. Yeah, that's bullshit. But I'm not a lobbyist for the sexual harassment attorney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was the whole Me Too movement was what kind of lit the fire under that one. Yeah. But every, yeah, so that's what you know got, because all those all those women had either arbitration or they had non disparagement clauses, and so there was a lot of legislative activity after that. But you're right for the rest of us who are yeah. fortunately not experiencing sec sexual harassment, but may have other problems. You know, whether it's with your credit card or with your employer. A lot of them now use arbitration agreements and, and you know, it's, it's barring you from the courthouse door does take a few of your arrows out of your quiver. And correct me if I'm wrong, because you're an attorney, it, it does take away some of your rights, right? Because, you know, the right of your constitutional right to defend yourself in a court of law is... It's kind of, you know, constitutional, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you, you do waive. You, I mean, that's how they get you, right? I mean, like you're signing the arbitration. So they can't force you into arbitration. You have to have signed the agreement. Yeah. But as what happens with a lot of us, I mean, as me too. I mean, I should know better. I'm a lawyer. But, you know, you get the, you know, whatever the software update, you get the credit card <laughs> statement. It's 18 pages long. You're like, I'm not reading this thing. I'm just signing it. It's got an arbitration provision. So yeah. you've waived you know, those, those constitutional rights that you would ordinarily have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, you know, and you're just, you just want a job, man. You want to pay the bills right. and provide for your family and stuff. And you just want a job. So you're like, oh, okay, well, I'll sign this. The other thing is the non-compete agreements. Those are really damaging. I never really thought anybody really enforced them until we hired some people one time that had non-compete agreements and got sued. The, uh, we ended up winning, but Man, it was, uh, I was like, I guess this is a really big deal for people. I know it's a big deal for big companies because usually there's some tech knowledge that goes and IP knowledge that is, can be very valuable. Like when the Waymo guy, I think there was a guy who left Waymo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He went to Waymo. Yeah. And he took a bunch of the trade secrets and yeah, that's technology good. secrets. You know, that, that becomes a big deal. Yeah. But yeah, negotiating out of those things is really important, especially if you're just a little tradesman sort of person. Where you're like, hey, you know, I need, we need to get me out of this non compete agreement because I guess people enforce them. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Non competes can be a big deal. And that's one of the things I raise in the book when I talk about knowing what your objectives are, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you take it to an attorney, you know, attorney is going to, uh, most of them are going to try to do right by you and do what you want to do. But the attorney's looking at it like, can I win this in court? You mm -hmm. know, give a boy a hammer. Everything starts to look like a nail. But so maybe your objective is you're like, I don't want to run off the court. I don't even really care about a, a severance. I just want to have this non-compete because that may be the most valuable piece to you. Yeah, and it can, it can be an easy give for the company because they're not having to write a check. And a lot of times, just as with arbitration provisions, they use these things. They overuse them. I mean, there's some cases where like fast food industry uses them with their people who work there. Like who needs a non-compete for somebody who's flipping burgers? But they do. They have these non-competes. Uh, and so a lot of people have them, they don't realize they have them. And that's an important thing to know when you're, you know, when you're, when you're headed out. And, and if you have leverage to use it to say, hey, I'll sign this, I'll go. 
I'll waive my rights because I've talked to an attorney and I know I, know I don't have a great case anyway, but I want this non-compete out. And yeah. that can be a huge, that can be the most valuable piece of it. There you go. And if they've done some things that violate their thing, I mean, you know, you, you have to, in business, when it comes to bringing in attorneys or suing someone or their CU, you know, you have to do the math. What is this going to cost once we bring in the attorneys? And so it makes sense to negotiate a settlement. I mean, I don't, I don't think we ever did one thing to avoid costs of a settlement, but I mean, we've, we paid people off. Look, here's some, here's some walking money, hit the bricks, be happy, sign this form and go just to get rid of them. Cause they were shit employees. Yeah, sure. And we didn't want to go through the three warning phase. We're just like, Hey man, we we'll just called it a, yeah, we'll give you some money and, and a pie. And you know, that works sometimes. Yeah. And I, I think for the employee, right. I mean, that's one of the issues that I raise is, how much is your time worth? You know, if I, if you can, if you come to me and I'm like, okay, I could take this to, to a lawsuit and I think I could get you six figures. You know, I could get you, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, but it's going to take me 15 months. You're going to have to be deposed. You're going to have to go through all the, you know, all the discovery that's going to be expensive, you know, or I can get you 20,000 right now, you know, and you're done. And I, that's another point that I make. I mean, you just really have to be, as the employee or somebody thinking about what your rights are, it's like, what, what is your objective here? You know, is that, and some people, they do, they're like, this is really important to me. I want to see justice done. <clears throat> there could be any number of reasons, what I call, you know, non-monetary. It's just important for you to take action that it's worth filing in, in, in court and going that route. Mm-hmm. But for a lot of people, it's not. And they're like, yeah, you know, all things being equal, I'd, I'd prefer a hundred thousand rather than 20, but I also don't want to spend the next 15 months of my life, you know, tied up in dealing with this issue. Yeah, and in discovery they'll they'll run you through the train where right. they'll, you know they'll check your I don't know they'll want your health records they want all your previous employers they're gonna find out yeah you know, what medications you're on probably yeah. and go through all that sort of character destruction sort of stuff but this is really important so in the book you use the story of Matt and Lynn two fictional characters and do you run them through several scenarios i guess with an employment lawyer yeah so it's sort of a a narrative throughout the book and they have slightly different issues you know one of them who was fired wrongfully one of them who had problems while she was still at work and i kind of walk them those fictional characters through the like i would if you were in my office you know walking them through the stages of analyzing their case analyzing you know one of the big things i talk about in the book is what are your damages, right? Like, mm-hmm. what what is is the juice going to be worth the squeeze here? Because you could have a great case that's mm-hmm. you know that the slam dunk. I can show that the employer did something illegal, but you don't have any damages there. You're not going to win anything because let's say you left and you got an even better job. Okay, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe you can get some emotional distress damages, but it's not going to be a bunch. You know, mm-hmm. starting there, like what is if we took this all the way and rung the bell, what's the best that you could get? And then work your way backwards from there using these factors like, you know, what is important to you? Is this an emotional issue where it's important for you to pursue it? Is it just a matter of trying to get onto that next better job and getting a be- better severance? And so it's Matt and Lynn going through the entire process. One of them settles early, one of them goes into litigation and how I would be advising them or talking to them, you know, about this process. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you don't want to stay working in a company. I mean, maybe you do. Or some people might want to. I don't want to stay here. I've had companies where there's just one bully in the group, and I like everybody else there. And But the one bully is just decides to make you his whipping post or her whipping post, I suppose, and they had that. But, you know, I mean, I've had a lot of girlfriends that come home and tell me all the stories of them not getting along with so-and-so at work and, and everyone in the thing. And, you know, some, sometimes it's outrageous. There's sexual harassment I've seen, you know, and I've done the write-ups for sexual harassment, our companies for people, you know, that's a big, big deal. You can't screw around with that stuff, but yeah, it's, it's interesting, but I, I like the fact that you give people empowerment on what they can do. Cause if you can negotiate a good exit, that gives you some some money to pay the bills for a few months, you know, you're probably not going to get an ugly recommendation from that employer. They're probably going to just be like, Hey, just forget that person existed. And uh, you can, you can move on from them and get yourself a better job with maybe some people you're happy with. 
No, absolutely. I, I think the government's a little bit different. We represent a number of federal sector oh, really? employees. Yeah. And th- uh, there you could get on a PIP and it's much harder to fire somebody in the federal government. You mm-hmm. have more protections and there's more opportunity to get transferred. But if you're not in the federal or state government, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, so even when we're advising people who are having problems at work, it's just a question of when they're leaving. It's not a okay. question of if they're leaving because you're right. I mean, it's not I just doesn't end well for anybody because you don't, as the employee, you don't want to be there. They don't want you there anymore. You know, it's just a matter of how you kind of unwind that, which is, you know, another point I think that's important for people who to understand who are still at work is that, you know, this is a card you can play that does not available after you've been fired. If you, something illegal has happened to you, let's say you've been, you've been subject to sexual discrimination or you know someone else who has been and you go to HR Always mm-hmm. better do it in writing and report it. And then they fire you or do something to you afterwards. You have two claims. You have not only the underlying harassment claim or whatever it may be, but then you have a retaliation claim, mm-hmm. which is a completely separate. And in fact, you could lose you could lose the discrimination piece and still recover on retaliation because wow. as long as you have a good faith belief that's what is happening to you is illegal. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can recover on that. So that's an example of if you're still at work, you ha- both sides have different cards that they can play. But if you're still at work, there's some things that you can do that'll put yourself in a really a much better situation. And when that happens, you definitely are going to want to get out, right? I mean, it's very rare, right? You go report something to HR. You know, they may they may bide their time, but nine times out of ten, you know, you're a goner. So you might as well use that to your advantage. Because look, if if I'm a defense side lawyer on one of those cases, and I get one of those, you know, like it gets run up the chain to me, I'm telling the company, hands off this guy, do not mess with him because you're going to get, you know, you're going to get a retaliation suit. And what often happens is they don't get to their lawyer or they don't get the advice. And Mm -hmm. it's understandable. Managers get mad. They get angry. They've been accused of somebody. And so they're like, okay, you're fired. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a great lawsuit. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I don't know if this is applicable to something. The first, the other question, first question I have for you was, are are, are retaliation lawsuits and stuff like that or retaliation protection laws on the books in most states or is it federal? State and federal depends on your state. Mm -hmm. Some are better than others, but yeah. yeah, And and almost in most federal anti-discrimination laws and even wage, your Fair, Fair Labor Standards Act, the big wage law, uh, they have retaliation protection. So again, you can be wrong. You could go to the company and you could say, I think I'm being, you know, you, I, I am being paid unequally to this person. It has to be based on sex, to this guy or this oh. gal. And you could be wrong, right? Because the the numbers actually show that you were not paid unequally. But I, but I believed it. I have a good faith belief. Then I'm protected, even mm. though there was no actual you have to have a good faith belief. You can't make stuff up. But yeah. but most federal laws have that provision, and a lot of state laws do as well. Interesting. You know, there's a lot of people I've seen on social media and TikTok that I think are HR advisors mm-hmm. or people used to work in HR. And one of the main themes that I hear from all of them is never think HR is your friend. Yes. <laughs> That is good advice. Agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I you know, I, I feel just a little bad because there are a lot of good people in HR. Yeah, I mean, they sure. go, yeah, they go into it because they want to help people, and and they will. Mm-hmm. I mean, they all, you know, like the health insurance issue, like they're helping you through those sorts of situations. But look, at the end of the day, who's paying their salary? It's yeah. the employer. So you have one of two things happen: either. You know, HR circles the wagon on behalf of you know those that pay them, mm-hmm. uh, or. HR doesn't have any power. You know, they don't have anybody in the C-suite. So HR is like, hey, I don't think you should fire this person. And mm-hmm. C-suite says, I don't care what you think. You know, we're going to fire them anyway. But but the but the underlying point is true. You've got to treat HR like they are <clears throat> just an arm of the company, which, which they are. So uh, that's what, another reason why, you know, I'm always a fan of having an attorney who can even just advise you behind the scenes. Like, you don't have to, like you know, have them, you know, get on their trusty steed and ride through the front doors, but just somebody, you know, that, that, that you can call and say, hey, I've got HR just called and they want me to come down for this interview. What do I do? And it's going to be really, you know, tricky, you know, tricky things to deal with. And it's good to have somebody in your corner. Definitely. Definitely. And, and you have a working knowledge where you can stand up for yourself. And I, I like the yearly payout process where you can say, hey, look, you know, I, I see you're trying to put me on this fast track to get me out with this program. Look, clearly, you know, we know all where this is headed. We're all grownups. Tell you what, let's work out some sort of settlement. And then if you've got some leverage with the mice from attorney where you can say, hey, you know, you guys haven't performed in good faith in these certain areas, then you can 
then you can have some negotiation and and then get out of there with you know where you can get, have some payments and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think of a lot of these lawsuits now that tech world's going through? There's a lot of tech world where they just basically overhire and they're just laying yeah. people off like it's going crazy. I remember. So one of the things that Elon Musk was doing when he fired people from X. Did you see any abuse in some of the stuff? Because it was pretty prevalent in the public. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's you know there were a number of lawsuits against him, not only by individuals, but the National Labor Relations Board has gone yeah. after Tesla and SpaceX. And you know there were some allegations that in those mass layoffs they were targeting people. Again, allegations. I don't know this to be true, but the allegations yeah. where they were targeting people who were pregnant. Getting back to your pregnant, you're wow. fired, or had disabilities. And that they were letting those folks go. And then there were some, mostly from the higher ups, but, you know, where they had some, most of us don't have these, but some kind of the, in the C-suite level, you have kind of a package, like you're going to get X amount of dollars if, unless you're fired for cause. And the allegations were that he fired a bunch of people and didn't, didn't live up to those agreements. And now they're suing him. So he's keeping, he's keeping a lot of lawyers busy. Yeah, I think he's got a class action from these employees. That yes. Thing. And here's a good question for you, and I, this plays into that Elon Musk thing. You know, he made a demand of people that you're going to come in the office, and if you don't show up tomorrow, you're fired. Yeah. Which is kind of an interesting way to play it. And a lot of employers are trying to do this clawback, and they've either failed or or I think mostly they're failing anytime they do it. What are, what are some of the rights, or do you have any tips for people that are getting the clawback yeah. to try and force back in the office? Yeah, find another job. I mean, <laughs> you know, they, they've got the right to force you back in the office. There are rare circumstances in which they don't. Again, if you have a disability, let's say you're, you know, one of your accommodations is that you get to work from home, then you, you would have a, a lawsuit. And that is becoming more... I wouldn't say prevalent, but it's the idea of having a work from home, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, even courts are like work from home. Nobody does that, you know, but, but now everybody knows it's a thing. So you, if you have a legitimate disability and working from home is a, is a reasonable accommodation that can be a protection. But if you're not in that bucket and they're saying you got to return to work, then, then you got to return to work. You got to find another job. I have a disability where I have to work in my underwear and that's like, <laughs> that's an interesting accommodation. I have, I have a note from a doctor on that. Yeah, it's a, companies have something called they can get out of these these accommodation requests if it's an undue burden. I, I, Chris, I think that might be an undue burden to allow you to work in your in your underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! I thought that was going to work. I'm going to have to read your book. And <laughs> I know, right? To, to sue, I'm going to sue the Chris Voss show. You what? should, right? My, my producer says I own it. <laughs> no, this isn't going to work out at all. So there you go. If, if final thoughts as we go out that we haven't maybe touched on in the book, you want to tease out to people so they pick it up. Yeah. So I, I think that one of the big pieces of it is to to sit down. I mean, of course, you got to know what your rights are. You got to know that know the legal ball, nuts and bolts. But like, what is it important to you about this? I mean, for me, it's it's all it's all about feeling empowered and standing up for yourself. Mm -hmm. But that can mean different things to different people. So maybe that is just getting a better severance. Maybe it's, you know, taking any action at all. Maybe it's filing a lawsuit, but really, you know, taking some time to unpack that. Like maybe, for instance, it's a harassment case and you've got a daughter at home who's kind of watching you and you want to show her like, hey, this is not, we don't put up with this. You know, that's different than somebody who's, hey, I just want an extra 10% on my severance. Both are legitimate goals, but to... Give that some thought before you start. There you go. So give now with your website, do you, can you advise people nationally? Are you required to, can you only do it by in certain states? How does that work and how do people reach out to you and onboard with you? Yeah, so we represent folks mostly in, in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. We do accept some clients in North Carolina, Texas, and New York. For everybody else, like you can still call us and we have a, you know, we're happy to make referrals. You know, we know people in most states who do our work and we've got just a ton of information, YouTube, website that we're happy to, you know, to point people to just to be a sounding board. And for federal workers, we'll, we can handle them nationwide. So I would say, give us a call. If we can't help you, we'll let you know, but we'll get you on to somebody who can. 
There you go. It's definitely, I wish I would have known you back when I worked for other people. I was always getting fired. <laughs> <laughs> it, Turned out okay for you there, right? It, it did. It. <laughs> it did. And, you know, but I mean, I'm sure there's people that, you know, I didn't have a wife or kids or I wasn't a single mom with a bunch of kids. I was able to kind of hang in there. But, you know, there's, I think there's sometimes I was eating top ramen for a while, but yeah. in my youth. But, you know, you, you can have a job. Those paychecks stop coming. You, you, and, you know, I think nowadays it's, I hear a lot of people complaining about how long it takes to find a new job. I think the employment market's shifting now where it's gone from all the power what kind of went to the employees there with COVID. I think it's falling back now. It's kind of interesting. Do you do you give any advice on, I suppose there's nothing you do about it. If, if an employer puts something before you that, you know, they're hiring you and they're giving that job offer, is there any sort of parlay in where you could read the small notes and you could be like, I really don't like this moderation arbitration clause that you have. Is there any way we can negotiate taking that out or is that just probably not a good idea? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, it doesn't hurt to ask, right? Particularly if you're far enough along in the process, it depends on what level you're coming in at, wh mm -hmm. how big the company is. I mean, if you're, again, you're signing on to be a fry cook at McDonald's, you've got zero leverage. <laughs> you, yeah. you sign those papers or you or you don't get the job. If you're yeah. coming in, let's say, you're kind of more middle management and you're coming into a company that's, that's not a national company, a lot of times what I see happen is these companies, you know, they may not even want what's in there. They just went to a lawyer or they or worse. They went to the employee. they went to the end right. They went to the internet and said, Give me a you know, give me an employee agreement and there's all this gobbledygook in here. And if you could point it out to them and be like, Hey, I don't like this paragraph, they're like, We don't either. You know, we'll take right. it out. It depends on how big the company is, what your leverage is. But there's generally I wouldn't ask it maybe in the first interview, but if you're far enough along and they want you, there's no harm in asking. Maybe when they make you an offer and they, they sign right. that contract in front of you right. and you're like, what is this about my first child and what's right. going on here? <laughs> That's what we put in our contract. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you might as well, right? If you got to, we don't want your leverage. First, yeah. We don't want your first child. You just have to name it after me. Then we're all so, good. Yeah. Then we're all good. I think, I think that's fair. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that and that and I get, and then any children after that have to be named. I don't know. I'm just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> It's evil just, contracts. Yeah, make sure just to give my card to all your employees <laughs> before we go. <laughs> They're never going to see this podcast. We're going to bury this one in the back. Be, what happened to that 11 o'clock? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, this guy's unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go give us your final pitch out and thoughts as we go out where people can buy the book where people can find you on the interwebs yeah so they can the, the best place is our website spigglelaw.com you can find me on linkedin at t spiggle also x formerly known as twitter you can find the book on our website you can also find both books on amazon there you go. It was fun to have you on, Thomas. Take and uh, let us know, is there any other books you're working on? You've got one for being pregnant, one for being fired. Is there any, any other thing? Yeah, we've got one in the works just for people who are federal government employees, because I said they have, have different rights. And then also for, I'm sure you're not in this category, but for people like me who are over 40 and can be you know, subject to age discrimination. So that's, that's going to be the two books we got in the works. So you're yeah. old, you're fired. It's going to be, be next. Oh. Yeah. You know what's a big thing I'm seeing is age discrimination in the hiring process. Oh, sure. Ageism. And yeah. I have a lot of friends that are 40 and 50, and, you know, they've been working for companies. I, I have no resume. I've been uh, on my own since 18, but so no one's hiring me. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't think McDonald's would pick me up. They'd be like, and you don't work with people, do you? You're an entrepreneur. I'm like, yeah. But well, you're right. What you called? You're like I'm me. You're you're, un free. you're unemployable. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted the job for the free fries. Come but on. a lot of a lot of people like right now are seeing ageism. There was a gal yes. who's a friend of mine, and the employer said, you know, you're kind of overqualified for this job, and and you're up there in years or something. You know, there's a kind of an implication of her age, and and they're really struggling. So I don't know how you can sue for discrimination of, from that angle if they haven't hired yet, but. Yeah, you could sue for failure to hire. Yeah, I mean, especially if they say something dumb like that, you know, yeah. hey, you're getting a little long in the tooth. You know, again, you'll be surprised what some people will say in an interview, but if that's clear evidence of age discrimination and failure to hire wow. as an actionable claim, and you're right, I mean, it's in tech and in sales, we see it a ton, right? You get hit your 50s and all of a sudden, yeah. you, you know, you've got 20 years with them and they can get somebody at 30 or 28 who they can pay half your salary and work twice as hard. So it, it's a big thing. In fact, I 
uh, another big thing recently is uh, I know New York State put this in where you have to uh, advertise your what you're paying people. Yeah, yeah, your transparency laws. Yeah, and uh, that's a real big deal. And I was shocked when I heard that they weren't doing that. And like people would go through six stages of a interview process, to find out there was fifteen bucks an hour for yeah. a high end job, and you're like, yeah, that's, that's really evil. Yeah, I know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, New York, D.C. I think California. There are a couple of states that have yeah. these pay transparency that say you know you've got to put it in the you, know, you got to put in the job at it we'd, we'd have seen some companies try to in run that like the, the range is fifty thousand to five hundred thousand so, you know but but it is it is a big help and that's yeah. a that's a new thing on the scene that i think helps employees I imagine if you find out somebody's getting somebody's at your equal thing and you're both doing equal work and you're getting paid on a differential i don't know maybe is that a thing sometimes? yeah that's a equal pay act that's a uh, those yeah. are great Great cases from an uh, from an attorney standpoint. Yeah, um, that's yeah. why I pay everybody fifteen dollars an hour and no more. No one complains. Exactly. Just keep a cap on it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care how good you are. That's all you're getting. <laughs> <laughs> Your salesman on commission, fifteen dollars. <laughs> That's right. The commission is fifteen dollars now. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Evidently, the DOJ, you know, you've you've dealt with them. Evidently, the DOJ is le- leaning on the NAR settlement for the National uh, Association of Realtors, and one of their implications is they're they're suggesting that realtors should just go pay, be paid minimum wage Oof. and hourly. And I used to be a realtor and I a mortgage company for 20 years. And I'm just like, it's a real interesting game you're playing there. Yeah. Can't um, imagine how that helps anybody, but. Obviously. I don't know, but I know, I know a lot of realtors who are severely overpaid that, that, I mean, you're going to, you're going to put a lot of people out of business. Of yeah. Welfare if you do that. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be huge in a bad the whole way. Structure that game is built a certain way of yeah. commissions. But I mean, I don't know how you get it. I don't know how you get away from the grift because, I mean, that business has got so much problems with with you know, people not holding up their. That was where I learned the term. What was it? A fiduciary duty, mm. where you have you have a duty to your client to uphold. I think lawyers do too. You have a duty to your your client to represent them as best you can and not betray their trust or something like that. Yeah, exactly. But, and uh, boy, there's a lot of that cross the line of that business. Who oh. understands that business except realtors? Nobody and the mortgage people. Like I, last time oh, I yeah. bought a house, I was signing all kinds of stuff. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I don't let's know just what this do means. Let's just think about my first child. Anyway. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Thomas, for coming to the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Order of the book, folks. Wherever fine books are sold, fired. Afraid you might be. Use legal leverage to fight back against your employer and win on your terms book two of two of the fire book series you might want to pick up the pregnant one the pregnant book i'm reading that now just in case march 27 2024 thanks so much for tuning in go to goodreads.com for just chris foss linkedin.com for just chris foss chris foss one of the tiktokity the most crazy places on the internet thanks for tuning in be good to each other stay safe we'll see you guys next time